Well, good morning. It's great to be back here to Faith after uh, being gone. Uh, it seems like two weeks ago we had that snowstorm. Was that ridiculous or what? Um, seriously, I mean, cancel a whole church service just because we can't get out of our street. Um, <laughs> Amazing, but it's, uh, it's great to be back in the house of the Lord. Last Sunday, Karen and I had the opportunity to um, uh, head down to Florida. I know, I know. Uh, we were down there for a pastor's conference, and uh, we had just an awesome time hearing fantastic messages, uh, being blessed by enormous choirs and orchestras and all kinds of musicians. It was, it was just a, a phenomenal, phenomenal time. Uh, it was uh, hectic, but it was good. Uh, we'd start at 9 o'clock in the morning, and we we would leave there at 9.30 at night. I, I don't know, I think we heard 15 or 16 messages and then also seminars and so forth. So uh, kind of a, a brain overload in some ways, but it was just really a, a blessed time. It really was. Had the opportunity just kind of, you know, you kind of go in there and you say, as I look around at all the vendors and everything that's there, um, you know, everyone in Christendom, and, uh, you know, you're looking at all of these things, and you're thinking, oh, I've seen this all before, and, and so forth, and it's interesting how, as you listen to the messages, God just softens your heart, and by the time you leave there, you're really transformed. I mean, God has really spoken to you about a number of things, and, and really uh, worked in your heart, so I just, um, I enjoy preaching, but I, I just really can't get over just listening to someone bring the word of God. Uh, that's a, a huge, huge blessing, so we were blessed, and uh, it's great to be back uh, certainly in the house of the Lord. These two gentlemen here want to put a Bible in your hand. If you don't have a Bible this morning, they would love to give you one, so just slip up your hand as they come by. Uh, they, they'd love to do that. I do want to mention that uh, Karen and I want to thank uh, each one of you for uh, uh, giving. We received our Christmas uh, uh, gift while we were away, and uh, that was very generous and very much a blessing, so we appreciate that. And I am mindful uh, of the fact, especially after our first service this morning, where there were so many Bronco jerseys and orange shirts, that today is indeed Super Bowl Sunday. Someone asked me, who's going to win the Super Bowl tonight, Pastor Kevin? And I said, well, I said, uh, I already know who's going to win the Super Bowl. And they said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, I said, I have taped the Super Bowl from last year, and I'm planning to watch that again. It had such a wonderful ending that I'm just going to watch the whole thing over again. It's just fantastic. And listen, you Ravens fans, it was three years ago that you guys hit the high note. So go back and watch your team play. I'm sure you've probably got it on tape. And if you're a Redskins fan, um, you might be able to catch a black and white version of something. I don't know what. Ouch. Ouch. 1 Thessalonians, would you turn there, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. It is, seems to me like it's been so long ago that we did the intro here to the church of Thessalonica. Uh, the intro was all about the city and all about the people and about the different things that were transpiring there. We went to Acts chapter 17, as you may recall. And we talked about the Apostle Paul, along with Silas and Timothy, who came through the area and they began to sow the seed of the gospel there for three different Sabbaths in the synagogue. And it was there that these people heard the good news of the gospel. And the Bible says that there were some of these Jews who were there who responded positively and indeed were indeed were saved. And there were some devout women who were saved. And there were a great number of Gentiles or Greeks who were proselytes who had come into Judaism, they were present there in the synagogue, they heard the gospel, and they were also saved. So you have this large number of people who are born again, and it's just a wonderful thing. But Paul, if you recall, was driven out of the city, and he had to leave the area. He went down to Athens, and there he's going to leave and come back eventually, but he is going to have to leave the area. He goes to Berea, which is a town that's just outside of Thessalonica. And while he's there, the Jewish leaders come down to try to push him out of Berea. And that's what happens. When they all arrive, that is Paul and Silas and Timothy, uh, back in Athens, they decide to send Timothy back. Timothy, you need to go back and you need to help the people at Thessalonica. You need to be the discipler of these people who are new in their faith. And so Timothy goes back and he works with them. 
And Paul doesn't have a lot of information until Timothy comes back. And it's at that point when Timothy returns that he's able to tell Paul about all the things that are happening there. And Paul is going to now write a response to what he's heard from Timothy back over to the people at Thessalonica because, quite honestly, they have some concerns. And so, for that reason, Paul is going to be able to open up and just teach them about some fantastic things that they need to know and understand. So here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, we're introduced to some of the important aspects. In chapter 1 and verse 2, the apostle says this. He says, we give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. And the main point of this passage of Scripture that we're looking at this morning is Paul's thankfulness for what has happened at Thessalonica. He's going to say two things under that that are the main points of this passage, and everything else is going to be a a minor point, but a very important one. He says this, two things. Verse 3, he says, remembering without ceasing your work of faith, labor of love, and patience of hope. And then after that in verse 4, he's going to give us the next point. He's going to say, I'm thankful because I know, or I've come to know, your election by God. Those are the two main points that he's going to give thanks for. So this morning, what we're going to do is we're going to seek to mine the gold out of these verses of Scripture. It's interesting, 1 Thessalonians really doesn't get rolling in chapter, until chapter 4 when Paul is going to say, finally, brethren, I urge you and exhort you, and he's going to begin to teach them some new things. Here what we're going to do is we're going to find the gold that's embedded in these verses. If you've ever watched the TV show Gold Rush, you know what I'm talking about. In Gold Rush, they take all of this and they have to strip off all the overbird, and that's the topsoil and trees and stuff, and then they get it on down to the, to the, to the gravelly part and, and all the way down to the bedrock, as it were, and they take all of this stuff and they pour it into this big uh, wash plant, and uh, the, the water hits all these rocks, and the rocks uh, get diverted off to the sides, and they call them tailings, and, and eventually these heavier pieces of gold settle down into these mats and it's there that they clean these mats out and they find all of this gold and they weigh it up at the end of the week and they say we made this much money this week well let me tell you we're going to get into this passage of scripture and we're going to seek to extract the gold and all of God's word is gold isn't it and what we want to do is we want to look closely at what the apostle Paul is so thankful for let's ask the Lord to bless our time shall we Father in heaven, we do thank you for the awesomeness of your word. We thank you, Father, for the results that the Apostle Paul finds when Timothy returns. For truly, Lord, we see in this passage of Scripture the power of the gospel. And we're amazed at your great, powerful gospel. We're amazed at the process of transformation that takes place because of it. Lead us, Lord, as we study this this morning. Help us, Father, to uncover much gold today. Help us, Father, to be encouraged and blessed as we analyze Scripture. Father, whatever the needs might be here this morning, may you speak to each one of our hearts. Help those, Father, who are yet not sure about Jesus and placing their faith in him. May you work in their hearts today. And Father, may each one of us find comfort as we come to this passage and understanding as well. Minister to us, Lord, I pray, where we are. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Well, the Apostle Paul is going to be thankful for three different things, and I want to just give those to you this morning. First of all, he's thankful for the spiritual development of the new believers. And we're coming to this passage here. The Apostle Paul is saying that he's giving thanks. He's remembering without ceasing their work of faith. The Apostle Paul starts off with this work of faith. He starts off with what is really at the crux of the issue. The Bible tells us in Hebrews that without faith, it's what? It's impossible to please God. Faith is absolutely what is required for us to be introduced and respond in a positive way to the gospel. 
If the gospel is all powerful, what we have to understand is it's going to become powerful to us because of the agent of faith that's at work in our hearts and lives. There are those who dis faith. I think of Christopher Hitchens, the late atheist, noted writer. He said that faith is the surrender of the mind. He said it's the surrender of reason. It's interesting to note that if you go back into church history, you find that there were old theologians, and I'm talking not the 50s, I'm talking way before that, I'm talking about people like Augustine, who tried to be able to understand the relationship between faith and reason, and found that faith and reason really are not mortal enemies, they can exist in harmony when truly understood. You see, what Paul is going to do as he begins to, to praise these people for the things that he's seeing and he's giving thanks for it, he recognizes that faith is truly a substance of reality that has an impact in a person's life in such a way that it's, undenying, uh, it's undeniable the existence of God. And so it's far from an absence of reason, isn't it? You see, faith is a substance, and it, it's a substance that's, that's truly uh, manifest in the life of the follower of Jesus Christ. And so faith is to be commended. He says this is a work of faith. It's the energy and the working out of their faith in their lives. And Paul goes on to commend them, not only for their faith, but also for their labor of love there in verse 3. Labor of love. The word love is probably the most characteristic word in all of the New Testament. It's really an amazing term. It's actually an action verb. It actually speaks to something that is, is taking place. It's actually occurring. See, love is sometimes used as a noun, but sometimes we understand it as an action word, and that's how Paul is intending it. See, these people are not only laboring in their faith, but they're also laboring in their love, and their expression of that faith is being seen in many different ways. Notice what Paul says here in following up this. He says, your patience of hope. These are the things Paul's giving thanks for. Your patience of hope. Patience is a great word. Sometimes it can be translated steadfastness, but here's, the, here's the, the, the crux of the word. The word speaks of remaining under something. That is, you have a burden and you remain under that burden. If you pick something up that's really heavy, your first inclination is going to be what? Where can I set it down? Right? I mean, that's just the way it is. I mean, we don't like to be under burdens, do we? We really don't. We, we seek to get out from under them as soon as we can. This week I have a dentist appointment. They're going to go in there and shoot me up with some Novocaine, I hope, because they're going to whittle that whole tooth down, and then they're going to put a temporary cap on it, and that's all because I'm in my 50s. The doctor said, all of these are going to go eventually, and so you're going to need to do this with all your teeth in the back. I said, that's wonderful, doctor. <laughs> when I go there, you know, the whole experience with the dentist is so fine, isn't it? Yeah. You go in, and the music is playing, and it's just great. And they, they let you sit in this Barca lounger thing, and it's kind of cool, and it moves around, you know, and they set you up, and they usually have some nice wallpaper, usually, right? I mean, it's like a wood scene or an ocean scene, and it's supposed to relax you. Uh, one dentist I was at, you looked up on the ceiling, and they had a scene up there. I mean, to tell you, it's just a wonderful experience, isn't it? No, it's not. You say to yourself, when you go into the dentist's office, your number one objective is to What? leave. <laughs> you, you see, my apology to Dennis, but, but, but the reality is that these Christians at Thessalonica were willing to be patient and steadfast. The Greek word hupomone means to remain under the burden. And what was truly instinctive in their lives, which is instinctive in ours, every time we lift something heavy, we want to set it down, is to take the burden and toss it to the ground. 
The burden in their situation is the persecution that they're experiencing. Do you remember when Paul in Acts chapter 17 is speaking the gospel there and the Jewish people come out and they run him out of town basically? The, the, the Christians come and say, listen, you gotta get out of here. What town did he run to, do you remember? Ran to Berea, that's right. And when he was in Berea, all the pressure was off, wasn't it? No more persecution. No, you say, that's not what happened, Pastor Kevin. What ended up happening was these Jews came from Thessalonica to persecute them in Berea. You see, there was the opportunity for Paul to leave Thessalonica. He could take that burden, what, and toss it down. When they came to Berea, Paul left and he went to Athens. You see, he took that burden and he went, but the Thessalonican Christians, they had that burden because they went back to Thessalonica. You see, they remained under that burden. And this is what Paul is, is so exciting, uh, excited about. He's giving thanks for the fact that they were willing to, to maintain that patience of hope. That steadfastness of hope. And so they remain under that burden. The word hope here is an interesting word as well. When we think of hope... In an American way, we usually use the word hope as something that we have wishful thinking on, right? I mean, it's kind of like, well, you know, I hope the Broncos win today. Uh, well, I hope the Carolina Panthers win today. Well, you don't know who's going to win today. And so they may or may not even have an equal chance. At Christmas time, we were just through Christmas, you said, oh, I hope I get one of those new Lexuses for Christmas. <laughs> and it was wishful thinking. You didn't get a car, did you? Now you know what I'm talking about. There's a lot of wishful thinking out there. Do you realize that there's over 20% of the Americans polled in this country believe that the lottery is their plan for retirement? I'm not making it up. It's over 30% in Canada. They think winning the lottery is going to set them up and they can retire. You see, that's just wishful thinking. That's just, that's just a dumb retirement plan, to be honest. <laughs> Why? Because it's really not based on any reality. We speak in terms of hope like that. But in the biblical sense of the word hope and how it's used in Scripture, it's used quite differently. It's used as a certainty that has just not yet occurred. And you see, what these people were doing is they were remaining under this burden, not seeking to dump it, because they were willing to bear the pain and the suffering, because they counted it worthy, because they had a certainty of what yet was to come. It's no wonder Paul gives thanks for these believers. How wonderful it is to be able to have Christians like this. And so Paul is thankful for their spiritual development. Second thing Paul is thankful for is for their witness to the power of the gospel. Pick this up with me here in, in verse 4. He says, knowing and he uses that word knowing, it's a participle, it means having come to know. Paul says, what I've been able to do is through Timothy's report, I have come to know your election by God. You see, truly these people were elect by God. Now the doctrine of election is, is certainly uh, scriptural. And there's been much made. This is one of those subjects that can be quite divisive at times as people go to the scriptures and try to figure this out. And we know from, from, from being able to study the, the, the past and the future and all of these things, people are always looking to try to figure out what exactly happens in the mind of God. And so people look to election and Calvinism has taken that whole process and worked out all the details for us. It's just wonderful. And on the other side, you have Arminianism and they've worked out all the details. And so the interesting thing is the more I'm alive, the more I realize we don't have the answers to it. The more I realize and the more I study, I come to the conclusion that truly there is a mind of God, is there not? And truly we can boil it down and we can say, well, the, we don't want to not talk about the doctrine of election because it's here in Scripture. But what does God mean by elect? And you find that word choices can go different directions. And depending on your understanding of these things, you can end up in different places. I tend not to overthink. I just want to be honest with you. 
I think God has a plan. I see God's role in my salvation. I see it as a straight line. And I see also the will of man and God allowing for whosoever will to come. And these are two separate lines, obviously. At some point they cross, and there you have salvation. At what point do they cross? I really don't know. Here's what I do know. You, don't you get tired of people telling you what you don't know? I mean, seriously, you watch those debates. I don't know. And, and you come away going, I don't think they know. And I was like, well, what do they know? It's like, tell me what you do know. Here's what I know from this passage. The Apostle Paul is using this aspect of election, that is the understanding that these people truly are believers. He says this about the gospel. He says in verse five, for our gospel did not come to you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit. So in verse five, Paul finishes the thought, because our gospel came to you not only in word, but power in the Holy Spirit, Paul is using the doctrine of election to bring these folks assurance. Now that could be odd in our thinking, but let's remember, it's not comfort because we know the eternal decrees of God, it's comfort because we see how the plan unfolds before us in history. You see, that's what brings us assurance. That's what brings us comfort. You see, there's something to be said for the power of the gospel that has transformed lives. And so what Paul is trying to say is, I'm looking at your lives, Thessalonians. I'm looking at your transformation. I'm looking at the power of the gospel. And what that proves out is that your salvation is reality. This isn't just a surrender of reason. This faith is real. Are you with me? This is why Paul is giving thanks because he can see how the gospel has impacted. Now Paul's testimony, Peter's testimony, the testimony of disciples and followers by the hundreds and thousands by this point are all concurrent in saying the power of God is real. And here we are in 2016, and my friends, the power of God is still real. You believe that? You believe it's a still a powerful gospel? I believe in the power of the gospel. I believe, as Romans says here, Paul says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Why isn't he ashamed of it? Because it's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. Jew, Gentile, it doesn't matter. He says, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it's written, the just shall live by it. You don't live by faith. You see, the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ is immensely important. It needs to be understood. When you share your faith with someone, it isn't about how eloquent you can do the job. It's not about you saying all the right things. You see, you could, you could stammer and you could, you could go on and on, but if you will tell people the truth of the gospel, as Paul did when he goes into the synagogue and he says, let me introduce you to Jesus who is the Messiah. Jesus who is the Christ. He does this for only three weeks and the results are amazing. See, the power of gospel of Jesus Christ is real. I have been personally challenged, not only through the messages that I heard while I was at the conference, because it seemed like over and over again, without perhaps their knowledge, the speakers at the conference seemed to, to keep going back to the importance of evangelism and the importance of sharing our faith. You see, if it's all about the power of the gospel, I need to do a better job of getting the information out there. I don't need to be eloquent to the point where, where I can somehow argue the gospel so that someone has to finally say, oh, uncle, I believe. <laughs> that's, that's not what it is. Paul would say this in 1 Corinthians. He says simply, and my speech and my preaching were not with pers persuasive words of human wisdom, but in demonstration of the spirit and of what? Power that in your faith should not be in the wisdom of man, but in the power of God. You see, what the church today needs is a, a dose of the power of God. That's what we need. 
We, we don't need more people who are trying to say it in such a way as to convince the skeptics. Some of the skeptics may never come around. What we need is simply to rise up, church, and tell people the simple salvation facts and how Jesus Christ has come as God and died on the cross but rose on the third day, and he now is my payment for sin. He is my Savior. When you tell people that, you, 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 we sit there and go, oh, man, yeah, but what, yeah, maybe they'll think I'm a jerk. What difference does it make? Give them the gospel of Jesus Christ and see the power of the gospel take off. Do you believe the power of the gospel is still as powerful as it was back here in 1 Thessalonians? I do. I do. I think the thing, the, the, the reality is that we've become so sophisticated as the church that we have reduced ourselves down to all types of gimmicks and programs to try to get people in the doors and keep them in the doors. What we need is the power of the Holy Spirit of God to do, do work in our lives. And God will change us in amazing, amazing ways. That's what I want to see. That's what I want to see in my own personal life, don't you? You want to see the power of God. Well, here's the third point this morning, and that is for the thankfulness of the Apostle Paul. He is thankful for the witness of the power of the gospel to the world as a whole. And there's four witnesses here to this power. Notice here in verse uh, six, you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit. You became followers of us. He, in other places, it's translated imitators of us. But this is the first thing that that hits me is that the fact is that they were imitating, the people in Thessalonica were willing to imitate Paul and they were willing to, to imitate Paul as he was a follower of Jesus Christ. And the idea here with this concept is that it's a perfect uh, following in the sense that this is going to be absolutely as, as Jesus is, the apostles are seeking to live that same way. No, they're not perfect. They can't duplicate it entirely, but that is ultimately our goal. And so we would look to the apostles and say, we also want to follow you. We also want to follow Jesus. And oftentimes what was done back in the day before they had the, the Philadelphia Mint was back in Jesus' day, and in here in Roman times, you would take a piece of metal and you would flatten it out with a hammer, and you would take then uh, another piece of metal with a hammer, and you would imprint whatever was on the bottom of what you had carved there. And so you would get an image maybe of Caesar, and you would bang, you would stamp it. Now we know in Thessalonica, they made their own money in the sense that they minted their own. They were different. Remember we talked about that. But they would take that imprint and boom, they would make that a replica of the original. And so this is what Paul is speaking about. And they all understood this language when he started to talk to them. And he says, you know what? You guys are the imprinted followers of Jesus Christ. Your lives are imprinted with him. Just as you are imitators of us, as we are of Jesus Christ, you are following in his footsteps. And this had a profound effect. Because as people noted their lives, they were also influenced. Notice what he says here. He says, so you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. For from you... The word of the Lord has sounded forth not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but in every place. Your faith toward God has gone out so that we do not need to say a thing. They become a sounding board for the gospel of Jesus Christ. And people now were looking to them to follow them. You realize in Christianity, the way God has set up the church has a lot to do with following. We're supposed to be becoming more and more like Jesus Christ. That's our goal, right? And we're on that, that trajectory, seeking to be more and more like Jesus. And yes, there are times when we take a dip, but we ultimately come back up and, and we refocus and we keep going. What I find is that in the church, there are people following people all the time. Examples. We're all examples. 
You may be an example to your children. I'm sure you are. But not only that, you are an example out into the world as well. You see, people are dying to know what a Christian really looks like. People are dying to know what Jesus looks like. And God is telling us that we can be a follower of Jesus Christ just as that coin is struck to the world. It was so profound that in the life of these Thessalonican believers, people were drawn to look to them to be an example. Are you with me? You have Jesus, the ultimate example. We have the apostles following, and now we have the world following the Thessalonians. This is really incredible. There was something about their lives that people took notice of and said, these people are worth emulating. Wow. My friends, listen. I know there was that basketball star that said, hey, I'm no role model. But we are all, every one of us in this room that names the name of Christ a role model. People are following us. People are looking, they're watching. Wouldn't you like to have this said about you? Same thing that's said about the Thessalonians. You're a sounding board for the gospel. You want to know what Christ looks like? You want to know what what godliness looks like? You want to know what effective Christianity is all about? Follow these people. They were a sounding board. I I like that term. It's almost like... uh, uh, It reminds me of my radio in my first car. Now, can I be totally honest with you? I mean, seriously, I had the highest technology known to man at the time. Uh, This was back when a a 1965 was not old, okay? So I'm I'm 16 years old, 17 years old. My dad buys me my first car. And I really wish I could have picked it out, but he he did an okay job. But he, he was into safety, you know? So he gets me the biggest piece of metal on the market. It's a 1965 Pontiac, which I like Pontiacs, and it was a Grand Prix. And I painted it, and I cleaned it all up. I did did the body work to it, painted it, and it it looked pretty cool. I mean, it was pretty cool. But here's the thing about the radio, right? This had technology that I'd never even heard of before. This is like 19, I, whatever. And so I'm sitting there going, all right, uh, let's see what this is all about. 1970s. So it's not all that old in today's standards, but it had a little box kind of made out of cardboard underneath the speaker in the back window. And it kind of stuck down in the trunk of this car. And on my dashboard, I had a switch. So when I turned my favorite song on and got it blaring on AM, (laughs) I could push this button that said reverb And the sound went down in this box and came out all warbly to pretend it was stereo. (laughs) And that's the word here in this original. It means to kind of bounce the sound around and push the sound out. My sound was horrible. And to think of what we have now, it's pretty amazing, isn't it? Well, as I listened to that sound get garbled up and pushed around inside of my car, I thought of this verse of scripture that says they were sounding forth the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, this this was bouncing around and being pushed out. And the world was hearing about Jesus through their witness and testimony. You see, this is effectiveness, isn't it? They were witnesses to this power of the gospel that had worked in their heart in an amazing way. Let me give you the next one. The next one is they were demonstrating the dynamics of change before the whole world. The world wants to know that Christians are different. Do you realize that? If we're just like everybody else, then why would the world be drawn to hear what we have to say? Why would you listen? You see, what these people did, according to the scriptures here, is two things. They turned to God, and they turned away from idols. Notice there in verse 9. For they themselves desire concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turn to God from idols. You see, that is a, an important phrase. This is one of those little gold nuggets, I think, that's embedded in this entire passage. This word, 
turning to carries with it the idea of being face to face, cross to cross, face to face. And the idea here is that they turned to God. They are face to face with Jesus Christ. This is pretty amazing. Now, you gotta understand what they didn't do first is it wasn't their turning from idols that brings them into a faith relationship with Christ. It was turning to the Lord. Ultimately, the second part of that would be if I'm turning to Jesus, I'm turning away from everything else, you see? And so what they're doing is they're turning to Jesus and they're face to face with Jesus. And this whole dynamic is really amazing. Because it changes who they are. And this is part of the reason why their testimony could go reverbing out to the whole world. They turn to Jesus. The Bible says that one day we will be face to face. Even though now we look through a glass darkly, we'll be face to face with Jesus. Won't that be wonderful? They turn to Jesus right now. And we're face to face with him while having their back turned to the idols of this world. The idols of this world is all that was part of their past. This is what, what used to occupy them. They were willing to stay under that burden. They were willing because they knew what life was like being face to face with the Lord. This, this new relationship with Christ is, has really spurred them on. They don't seek to drop the load that they're under. They were willing to allow the gospel of Jesus Christ to transform their lives. And it's important because under that persecution, it would have been very easy to just drop the load and go back to the way they used to live life, wouldn't it? Let me stop and think about it. They used to have all those idols there. When Paul leaves and, and he's gone and then Timothy comes, they could have listened to him for a while and, and then they could have said, listen, Timothy, thanks a lot for coming, but, but we're really just okay and we're going back to the way we like to live all the pressure would have been off all the difficulties would have been gone but not them they knew what it was like to be face to face with the Lord have you been face to face with Jesus Christ have you placed your faith in Jesus Christ and had your life transformed if you have you know the joy that that produces There is nothing that comes close to having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ and being close to Jesus, being face-to-face with Jesus. You see, if our heart's clean before God, we're always going to want to be face-to-face with Jesus. If there's unconfessed sin there in our life, we're not going to be so comfortable being face-to-face with Jesus, are we? The world's behind me, the cross before me. I have decided to follow Jesus. Is that your heart's desire today? Paul's giving thanks because this is the scenario that these people are demonstrating. Not only do they demonstrate all of this, they also demonstrate a commitment to serving. Notice he says, you not only turned to God from idols to serve, but to, it, there was a motivation to serve the living and true God. You see, this is what they were all about. They wanted to serve the Lord. And he's categorizing here God as living and true. Jesus in their understanding is alive. He died on the cross, but now he's resurrected. He is alive. And they're excited that Jesus is alive. You see, this face was was real after all, and, and Hitchens doesn't have it right at all. You see, this isn't the absence of reason. Paul is looking at all the proofs, and he says, this is fantastic. They turn in their lives to serve the living and true God because that's exactly what they believed, that Jesus is the true God and that he is truly, truly alive. But it doesn't stop there. There's there's one more verse there. Would you look at that with me, verse 10? Because it gives to us a, a fourth reason for Paul's thankfulness. They are, without a doubt, a unique people, and Paul is thankful for their attitude of hope. Because he says here that while they're serving the living and true God, they're waiting for something to happen. They're waiting for his son from heaven. They're ultimately waiting for Jesus to return. This same Jesus who he raised from the dead, even Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Now this is interesting because... This is going to set us up, this one verse, 
for the end of 1 Thessalonians, we get to chapter four and five, and we get over to 2 Thessalonians. You see, for these people, they were wondering about the future. It's so important that we understand the significance of the future, isn't it? Remember what I said about having that, that load. What are we trying to do with this burden that we're under? We're trying to find a place to set it down. You know, I'm reminded of the fact that as a follower of Jesus Christ, I have a sin nature. Do you have one of those? I have a sin nature. I find it's a burden. Do you find it's a burden for you? Are you looking to put it down? Someday it's going to get thrown down, isn't it? It's not going to follow me to heaven. It's not going to be there. It can only bother me so long. In fact, it's bothered me probably longer than it's going to bother me, if you know what I mean. And it's going to be gone. And my friends, that's the sweetest part about checking out, is letting this thing down. I've been carrying around this burden for 51 years. 51 years ago, I came to Christ. I didn't know I had this burden. I had it even before that, didn't I? But now I know it, and I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. But there's a future coming. It's not going to follow me forever. i, I got to show you this. Brother Joe Krippner, he, he is such a blessing. He likes to make these up for people. I forgot to shine it up to the folks in the first service. But this is a whole prophecy chart. Isn't that cool? He did it all by hand. He wrote the scripture verses in there. And uh, it's just wonderful. I'm going to frame this and put it on my wall. I think it's fantastic. And right there in the beginning, right here where the green is, talks about the coming of the Lord. You see, I have a future, and you do too. And I have an attitude of hope. And my hope's not wishful thinking. My hope is certain. Because the Bible speaks about the coming of the Lord Jesus. You remember over in John chapter 14? You remember that? Let your, your heart be troubled. You believe in God. You believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, you know, you're going to come. And then Jesus goes on and he says, I'm coming back for you. And he tells the disciples this. And when he tells the disciples that where I go, there you may be also, he says, I'm coming back. And all that the Thessalonians were focused on was the coming of Jesus. The time coming when they could finally put that burden down. And for them, it was not only the burden of their sin nature, it was the burden of persecution. You and I think we have it so bad, don't we? We got this big burden of our sin nature, and it's true. But they not only had that, but they had other burdens. But they remained under that burden because they knew the power of the gospel was so real. And being face to face with Jesus was so awesome that they looked forward to the future. Now understand this, they had some concerns. We're excited about the future, they would say to the Apostle Paul, but we have some concerns. Namely, what happens to those who are dying before the return of Jesus. Paul gives us a little glimpse of the future. Notice there in verse 10, right at the end, he says, they're delivered from the wrath to come. Isn't that great? You see, if they were thinking that Jesus Christ's coming would ultimately bring in God's judgment upon the earth and that wrath, Paul wanted to make sure that they were understanding that there was a bright future, that there was something to be optimistic about because they were not going to face the wrath of God. And my friends, listen, you're not going to face the wrath of God either. It says so right in our Bible. Isn't that great? What a blessing. You won't ever face the wrath of God. There is no condemnation. There is therefore no condemnation upon those who believe in Christ. But let me ask you this morning, maybe God spoke into your heart, and maybe you'd like to place your faith in Jesus Christ. The word of God went forward. It went forward from all over Macedonia and Achaia because of these people. And the word of God continues to go forth, doesn't it? It continues to go forth. Perhaps you're here this morning and you say, Pastor Kevin, I've never placed my faith in Jesus Christ. This would be a perfect day to do that. If God is working in your heart today, would you make that decision today to place your faith in Jesus? Be the best day of your life. Come face to face with Jesus knowing that your 
sins are forgiven, and you have a relationship now with him that's unencumbered because of sin. Maybe you're here this morning and God spoke into your heart about sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. Maybe he's spoken to you about being a follower of Christ and an example to the world. Maybe he's spoken to you about having hope for the future and remaining under that burden. As God has spoken to our hearts, I pray that today we would yield to his spirit and allow him to do a work in our life this morning that's life-altering. Would you pray with me? As we bow our heads and our hearts before the Lord, just before I make a mention of prayer, I wonder if there's anyone here today who would say, Pastor Kevin, would you remember me in prayer today? God's at work in my heart. And today I'd like to place my faith in Jesus Christ. Is there anyone at all that I might remember you in prayer? I won't name you or embarrass you in any way, but if I can pray for you, I'd be happy to do that. Would you just slip up your hand this morning and say, Pastor Kevin, remember me in prayer? Maybe you're here as a Christian, you say, Pastor Kevin, pray for me. God's at work in my heart. If God's at work in your heart today, would you just slip up your hand and I can pray for you? Amen. Amen. Thank you. Father, we do thank you and we do praise you. For there is none like you. And I thank you, Father, for the gospel that came to these people who were not even as noble as the folks in Berea. And yet, Father, the gospel's transforming power did a miracle in their lives. Lord, how we thank you for the transformation process that you've put in our hearts. And may you encourage us today, Lord, to live for you in a way that truly reflects our love for you. Work in these who have raised their hands this morning and asked for prayer. Lord, you know what the scenario is. You, you can deal with us, Father, individually because of the Holy Spirit of God, and you can uniquely alter our hearts and lives. But Father, work in their lives and produce in all of us, Lord, I pray, a desire to be like the Thessalonians. Not perfect, but truly demonstrating Christ to a world that needs to see it. May we be truly the carriers of the gospel to this world. And may we sit back and watch how the power of the gospel impacts those that we share it with. Father, how I thank you, Lord, for doing a work in our lives today. Bless us in the week ahead, I pray, Father. May we glorify you in all things, for it's in Christ's name we pray it. Amen. God bless you.